If you're looking to upgrade your cassette tape equipment from a boombox or a Walkman or a shoebox recorder to a proper component tape deck without spending hundreds of dollars on a good quality new deck like this TACW1200 or a completely refurbished vintage deck, that means you'll have to take your chances at finding a used deck that will probably be sold as is with no guarantees or returns such as this TAC W370C I just found at the thrift store. The price on it was $14.99, but it was a 50% off discount, so I got it for $7.99, including sales tax. Even though I have no need for this cassette deck, because I already have other ones that are far superior to it, I thought it was worth picking up to serve as a test subject to demonstrate some of the features to look out for when you're choosing a used cassette deck, some of the ways you can test the deck before you buy it, and also how to refurbish the deck once you do buy it, without needing any special tools or equipment. <laughs> First, some of the features to look out for when considering whether or not to buy a vintage cassette deck. You can see this is a double cassette deck, but that's not necessarily an advantage because the only real benefit to having two cassette decks in one unit is that you can copy one tape to another. And in fact, all of the really high-end cassette decks are strictly single deck designs. They're not double cassette decks. You can also see this one has a basic mechanical piano key design where you get direct push buttons for all the functions and your force of pushing the button is what activates the mechanism. The higher quality decks have soft touch controls. It only takes a very light touch to activate them and then the machine does the rest of the work in moving the mechanism into position and the high-end decks have what is known as full logic controls where all the controls are just electronic push buttons which barely move at all when you push them and the machine electronically activates all the functions and some of those can even be operated by remote control. But for a beginner, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a basic mechanical push button deck. Next are some of the features which are the main reason to choose a component tape deck over a stereo system that may have cassette decks built into it along with a radio tuner, a CD player, maybe a record player. Those usually just have very basic cassette decks whereas a component tape deck gets you extra features such as Dolby noise reduction. This one has Dolby B and C noise reduction. Dolby B, the first and most widely used noise reduction system in consumer audio equipment, significantly reduces the background hiss when playing tapes that were encoded with it, including the vast majority of pre-recorded cassettes from the mid-1970s to early 2000s. Dolby C provides even greater noise reduction, but was not as widely used because it does not sound acceptable when played without the matching decoding, and is more sensitive to the alignment of the deck's heads. And for recording, you get a manually adjustable recording level and a level meter. These manual controls and level meters allow you to make much better quality recordings than a more basic cassette deck in a stereo system that just has automatic recording level, which usually doesn't do a very good job at getting the recording level right where it should be on the tape, where it's not too quiet and buried in a lot of tape hiss and not too loud and distorted. With a manual level control and meter, you can make those adjustments so that it's just right when you're recording onto the tape. And in addition to the aforementioned Dolby B and C noise reduction, the really nice features on this deck are its ability to record and playback chrome and metal tapes. Many decks also feature auto reverse, which gives you the convenience of automatically playing both sides of a tape without needing to take it out and flip it over. But it requires a more complex mechanism, which may make servicing the deck more difficult. There are many other bells and whistles found on higher end cassette decks, such as more advanced noise reduction systems, HX Pro, automatic music search, and bias calibration. However, I just wanted to cover the basic features that you're most likely to encounter when you're looking for your first cassette deck. But having all these nice features is meaningless if the deck doesn't work. The first thing to check out when considering whether or not to buy a used cassette deck is its overall condition. However, the way it looks on the outside may not necessarily reflect 
how well it works. Because I've seen plenty of decks which were covered in scratches and even rust and yet worked fine after I gave them a good cleaning. And other decks which were in pristine cosmetic condition but didn't work at all due to needing new belts or some kind of electronic fault. This one is covered in a fair amount of scratches. However, as the sticker here says, the top cover is covered with a scratch protection sheet. You may take it off if necessary. And yes, it definitely is necessary after probably almost 30 years of having it on. So let's see how easy it's going to be to take off this protective film. It was already fraying at the edge here, so I used that as my opportunity to start peeling it off. And hopefully it's just going to all come off in one big sheet. But it may tend to come off in little pieces. And underneath, it should look like a brand new cassette deck. Some of this is getting stuck underneath the front panel, so I'll probably need to remove the top cover to get all of it off. But that's at least the vast majority of it. But of course, of a cassette deck, it's the condition of the tape mechanism that matters the most. So looking inside this one, the first thing we can see is not covered in a thick layer of dust like I've seen in a lot of cassette deck mechanisms. And the head is nice and shiny as is the capstan. And one thing which can really tell you how heavily used the cassette deck was in its life is the condition of this rubber roller here. If you see a buildup of brown dirt on it or if it has a very shiny finish on it, those are both indications that the deck has been heavily used in its life. But this one has a nice matte finish on it, so it's not supposed to be shiny. It's supposed to be slightly rough, which allows it to grip the tape as it's running through the machine. Now that we've determined that this deck is in reasonably good condition, both cosmetically and inside the mechanisms, we of course have to make sure it works. So naturally the first thing you want to do is plug it in and turn it on. And when you turn on the cassette deck, you should see some sign of life. Usually the bottom segment of the level meter will light up if it's a electronic level meter like this. If it has old-fashioned mechanical meters, those usually have a little light bulb that lights up. However, they may be burned out. So even if it doesn't light up, that does not necessarily mean that the deck is dead. Next, I like to do what I call the finger test. This mostly applies to these basic mechanical push button decks because on the fancier decks that have soft touch or full logic controls, they usually will not operate without a cassette inserted. But on these basic mechanical push button decks, what you can do is hit eject to open the door and then press play. And hopefully you will see the take up reel start to turn. If it does not, that means the belts are no good and will need to be replaced. But even if this is turning, that does not necessarily mean that the belts are in good condition. Because if the belts have gotten stretched out of age, they may still have enough tension to turn this take up reel just spinning freely like this. But once you actually try to play a tape, they won't have enough power to turn the tape. So what I like to do and with it playing like this and just grab onto it a little bit and feel how much torque it has by how much you can grab onto it and still feel it turning. If it stops the instant you grab onto it, that means the belts are getting weak. But if you can tug onto this fairly firmly and still feel it turning like this one, that means the belts are in good condition. And likewise, do the same thing with fast forward. It won't be as strong as it is in playback, but you should be able to grab onto it a little bit and still feel it turning, like this one is. And the same thing with rewind. Now you saw it just popped out of rewind mode a few seconds after I engaged it. That's normal for a deck which has full auto stop because that means once it reaches the end of the tape when it's rewinding, it's going to detect that the tape is no longer turning and automatically stop. So you may have to hold down on the button to do the finger test on this, but you should be able to, again, resist the movement of the reel and feel it has a nice strong tension on the belt. So this deck passes what I call the finger test. 
even though that finger test is surprisingly effective, it's best to have a known good pre-recorded tape on hand to test it with. So you want to put it in, you want to make sure the deck rewinds and fast forwards and that you get some indication on the level meter when you're playing it. And of course you want to test both decks if it's a double cassette deck. And this one appears to be in working condition. If it pegs the meters as soon as you hit play, even without a tape inserted, that likely means that the record playback switch in the deck has dirty contacts. One quick fix you can do, which usually does work, is to open up the door, hold down the erase knockout tab detection thing with your finger. It's in the upper left corner here. You can feel it with your finger. Hold that down and press record, but not all the way, just enough that engages the mechanism and you can see that little red light come on and just hit that repeatedly like this and that scrapes off the oxidation from the contacts of that switch. And now when you play your tape, you should no longer have that problem. And you may have realized at this point in the video, we still have not actually heard what this deck sounds like when playing a tape. And that's intentional because there are a lot of situations where you may come across a cassette deck for sale that you're interested in, but you don't have any means to test what it sounds like when playing a tape. But if the deck passes all of the tests I've shown so far in the video, and it's reasonably priced, then I would feel confident in buying it. The first thing you should do when you get a used cassette deck is clean the mechanism. Even if it already looks clean like this one, clean it anyway. It's not that hard and only takes a couple minutes. On some decks you can remove the faceplate of the door to give you better access to the mechanism when you're cleaning it, but this one does not, so we'll just have to work around it. All you need is some isopropyl alcohol and some cotton swabs. I recommend using the pointed ones because they have a tighter pack of cotton on them which is less likely to come off in strands as you're cleaning the mechanism. So you just take your isopropyl alcohol, dip a cotton swab into it, and then you clean the race head. Just scrub it back and forth. And then the recording and playback head, same thing, just give it a good scrub. And then for the capstan, it's a lot easier if it's turning when you clean it. On this deck is easy because as soon as you turn on the power, the capstan start turning automatically, even without needing to press play. So we can just take our cotton swab and hold it against that and kind of go back and forth. And that will automatically, since it's rotating, clean all sides of the capstan as you hold the cotton swab up to it. You don't want to press it too hard right against the tip here because that tends to pull off some of the cotton threads onto the capstan. But if that happens, just pull that off with your fingers and start over. It's no big deal. If your deck does not allow you to have this rotating when you clean it, that's no big deal either. You'll just have to try to work at it from multiple angles to try to clean as much of it as you can. But for cleaning the rubber pinch rollers, I like to use window cleaner because it still does a good job at cleaning it, but it's less aggressive on the rubber than alcohol is. You can certainly use alcohol. I've done it myself many times with no ill effects, but I just prefer to use window cleaner when cleaning the rubber pinch rollers. So again, you just take your cotton swab, dip it in, and now you're ready to clean the pinch roller. And again, this is a lot easier if you can have it rotating when you clean it. On a simple mechanical push button deck like this, that's easy. You just press play and there it goes rotating. So you can take your cotton swab and just hold it up against it. And it, as it rotates, it's going to clean it all the way around. And that should do it. This one wasn't that dirty. 
Now that you've got your cassette deck and you cleaned the mechanism and it's all ready to go, you're going to need some way to listen to it. When I've done videos in the past about cassette decks, a couple people have asked me if these things have built-in speakers. That may sound like a silly question, but you have to realize it's not the 1970s and 1980s anymore when people had a rack full of stereo components in their living room. Most people don't have anything resembling a stereo system anymore, so when you get a cassette deck like this, you're going to need some way to play the music from it. One way to do that is with a pair of powered speakers like these Bose Companion 2 speakers. These are very popular these days with turntables and they work just as well with cassette decks. On the back of any cassette deck you'll find two pairs of RCA jacks usually labeled line out and line in or playback and recording. Now for playing tapes you use the output jacks also sometimes labeled playback or line out and you take a pair of RCA cables the white one goes into the left output and the red one goes into the right output and then you take the other end of the RCA cables and you plug it into your powered speakers this one has two sets of inputs they both do the same thing so either pair will work you just plug it in like that and now you're ready to play your music from the cassette deck into your powered speakers. Some powered speakers have a 3.5 millimeter jack on the back, which looks like a headphone jack. And for that, you'll need a cable like this, which goes from two RCA plugs to one 3.5 millimeter plug. You plug the RCA plugs into the output of the cassette deck, and then you plug this into the input of your powered speakers. If you want to connect your cassette deck to a traditional stereo amplifier or receiver, it may be a little confusing for a beginner because you'll probably see two sets of jacks labeled tape, such as this one which has a pair of RCA jacks labeled CD slash tape and another pair of RCA jacks labeled tape out. In this case, the pair of jacks labeled CD slash tape is an input to let you hear the audio coming from the cassette tape in the tape deck and the pair of jacks labeled tape out is an output from the amplifier to let you record whatever is playing through the amplifier onto a tape in the cassette deck. So the way you connect this is you take one set of RCA cables and you connect it from the output of the cassette deck, sometimes labeled playback, and you connect that to the tape input of the amplifier in this case labeled CD slash tape and you take another pair of RCA cables and you connect that to the pair of jacks on the back of the cassette deck labeled line in or recording and the other end of that goes to the tape output of the amplifier and now when you want to play cassettes you just move the selector switch on the amplifier to the position labeled tape or often there's a button labeled tape monitor that you push in and when you want to record you just move the selector to the position of whatever source you want to record from such as the radio tuner or the phono and that will automatically feed the output of the amplifier into the input of the cassette deck to let you record it. Some cassette decks have the added convenience of a headphone jack for private listening of cassette tapes without needing a separate amplifier, but they almost always use a larger quarter inch jack, so you'll probably need one of these quarter inch to 3.5 millimeter adapters to let you connect a modern pair of headphones. If you're in doubt about how to connect everything or how to operate all the features of your deck, read the manual. Even for decks which are 25 or 30 years old, you can usually still find the manual for it on sites like Manuals Lib, Hi-Fi Engine, Manuals Online, or sometimes even still on the original manufacturer's website. And don't be afraid to ask for help on user forums such as Audio Karma, Tapeheads.net, or the cassette culture group on Reddit. Now that we're all set up for playing tapes, let's finally hear some samples of what this cheap little cassette deck sounds like. I met a gypsy woman down in San Antonio Trouble, but I'll be all right. Never met a lady that I didn't like. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do? I think you better make it. Now, what you gonna do?
And here's an oddity. It's a pre-recorded cassette made using Dolby C noise reduction. A lot of people say that these didn't exist, that nobody ever made pre-recorded cassettes using Dolby C. But this one definitely was because I've tested it and it sounds best with Dolby C enabled. You know one thing time has taught me that having a piece of man is better than having no man at all. So I'm gonna just take what I got and work with it. You understand what I mean? The real fun with a tape deck is being able to make your own recordings and mixtapes. First you need to connect your audio source. You can record from anything that has a line level audio output such as a CD player or a turntable with a built-in or external phono preamp. Or using the same kind of 3.5mm to RCA cable I showed earlier, you can record from the headphone output of a smartphone or computer, but you may need to adjust its volume setting to get the best results. Then you need a blank tape or a tape whose contents you don't mind recording over. If you want to record onto a high bias chrome or metal tape, you may need to select the appropriate button or switch position unless your deck has automatic tape type detection. And if you want to use Dolby noise reduction, make sure it is engaged during both recording and playback. Then enter recording pause mode. Decks with full logic controls usually do this automatically when you press the record button, but on a basic one like this, you do it by engaging the pause button before you press record. Then you start your audio source playing and try to pick a louder part of the music to help you set the recording level. You may need to do a few test recordings to find out which level setting works best with the tape you're using and the kind of music you're recording. But a general guideline is to adjust the level control until you see the meter constantly peaking at or slightly above 0 dB. Once you get everything set up and ready to go, release the pause, wait a few seconds for the tape to get past the leader if you haven't queued it up already, and start the music playing. Now let's hear a sample of the recording I made from my turntable onto this laser type 1 normal bias cassette tape using Dolby B noise reduction. There's many more advanced things I could cover in this video, such as aligning the azimuth and demagnetizing your cassette deck's heads, calibrating its speed, and testing its wow and flutter, but I really just wanted to make this an all-purpose beginner's guide to cassette decks. Sort of a cassette decks for dummies kind of video, although I think if you're interested in a cassette deck, you're not really a dummy. You're a pretty smart person. And I'm glad I featured a very simple low-end deck like this because if you look on the tape forums online, you see a lot of glorification of the really high-end expensive decks with people posting threads like the 10 best cassette decks of all time and asking people what is your holy grail cassette deck. While I'd rather give some of the attention, I think these beginners decks deserve because they are affordable, easy to maintain, and they can have surprisingly good sound quality. 